Hey, welcome to Greenville Community Church, and I want to welcome you to week four of this incredible study of Ephesians. Hey, if you haven't been here over the last few weeks, I want to kind of do a quick recap uh, so you know exactly where we've been. We learned week one that we are blessed with every spiritual blessing, and let me recap this for us. It said uh, in Ephesians chapter one that God loves us so much that he chose us and adopted us as his child. He redeemed us and forgave us by Christ's death, and He sealed us and secured us by His Spirit. And then week two, we looked at the first half of of chapter two of Ephesians, and we talked about spiritual death, and we talked about spiritual life, and we even had the opportunity to, to hear testimonies from people here in our church who have asked Christ into their heart, and we got to see them baptized right here. It was completely awesome. And we summarized chapter 2, verses 1 through 10 this way. Walking with Satan brings death. Walking with Christ brings life. We are saved not by works, but by grace and through faith, for we are His workmanship. And then just last week, week 3 of the series, we looked at chapter 2, verses 11 through 22. And we learned about this this hatred between the Jews and the Gentiles. And we learned that that by Christ's death, this wall that, that separated the Jew and the Gentile was torn down, resulting in Christ's unifying act of combining the Jew and Gentile into one new people group. And that people group is called the church. The people group is the body of Christ. And here's how we summed up Ephesians 2, 11 through 22. We said this last week. You used to be an outsider without God and without hope. But now you are an insider, a citizen of God's kingdom, a member of God's family, and a temple that hosts God's presence. And so this morning, we find ourselves now in Ephesians chapter 3, and we are going to look at all 21 verses this morning. Now, I want to say this right out of the gate. Ephesians chapter 3 is a fascinating little chapter. The first thing you need to understand about chapter 3, this is so important. The first thing you need to understand is that the Holy Spirit actually sidetracks Paul right during the middle of his opening sentence. And the Spirit inspires Paul to reveal the mystery, this huge mystery about God. And once the mystery is revealed, then Paul actually picks right back up where he left off. And he continues his first sentence. Now, I want to show you what I mean. So hopefully you've already opened up your Bible. Okay, we're in Ephesians chapter 3. If you have a pen or a pencil, I want to encourage you to either circle verse 1 or maybe even underline it. Here's how Paul starts. He says, when I think of all of this, and by the way, when he says that, he's talking about everything we've already learned in chapter 1 and chapter 2. When I think of all of this, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the benefit of you Gentiles, boom, the sentence just stops, just completely stops in the middle of a sentence. In some of your Bibles, depends on the version you're reading, it may just have a dash there or a dot, dot, dot. See, what happens here is the Holy Spirit inspired this pause, this thought, this this verse. So now what happens is in the next few verses, verses 2 through 13, What happens is Paul explains now one of the best kept secrets about God. So do this for me. Take your finger, find verse 14. Look at how verse 14 starts. When I think of all of this. See, that's where Paul finally goes back to his original thought. So here's what you have to do in understanding chapter 3. Verse 1 is connected to verse 14 and then 14 through 21. That's all one thought. Then verses 2 through 13 are really more like a a parenthesis, or or I like to think of it as more like a, oh, by the way, I should tell you this before we go on. Are you tracking with me? Good. So here's how we divide chapter 3. Verse 1 and then verse 14 through 21 is really Paul's prayer for us. And then this little parenthesis in the middle, sandwiched in between, verses 2 through 13, is the great mystery is revealed. Now, since everyone loves a good mystery, we're going to concentrate on verses 2 through 13 this morning. So let's parachute ourselves in. We're going to start looking at verses 2 through 5. Here we go. 
right in the middle of the sentence. Assuming, by the way, that you know God gave me the special responsibility of extending his grace to you Gentiles. As I briefly wrote earlier, God himself revealed his mysterious plan to me. As you read what I have written, you will understand my insight into this plan regarding Christ. God did not reveal it to previous generations, but now by His Spirit, He has revealed it to His holy apostles and prophets. Let's stop there. So what do we learn? We first learn that God has divinely appointed Paul. He has divinely commissioned Paul to tell others, to tell the Gentiles, to tell you and me about this mystery. Now, it's very important to understand this before we go forward. This mystery, Paul did not discover it on his own. It's very clear in God's word that this mystery was revealed to Paul by God. You see, Paul, Paul wasn't taking the role here of a, of a Sherlock Holmes with his, with his deer stalker cap and his cherry wood pipe and, and his, his big old trusty magnifying glass so he could crack the case. You see, Paul didn't go out searching for this secret. He didn't go out looking for this great mystery. This great mystery was told to him. It came to Paul. You see, if anything, Paul's more like the character Dr. uh, Dr. Watson, who, who sat back and he got to listen to how the mystery unfolded. And you see, Paul got the unique opportunity to where God himself told Paul about this incredible mystery. You know, in the book of Galatians, we learn that God took Paul into the desert where he revealed many things to Paul. And we also learn in the book of Corinthians that God shared with Paul many, many uh, intimate details, details concerning Christ's death, concerning the Passover, and even details about the Lord's Supper. But now here in Ephesians, we learn that God has also revealed to Paul his great mystery. And he told Paul that he had been appointed to share this mystery with others. So the million dollar question, what's the big mystery? Well, Paul's been giving us incredible hints to this mystery all throughout chapter 1 and chapter 2. You see, Paul is actually, he's been completely consumed by this mystery from the very first word that he wrote in Ephesians. Again, in chapter 1, we learn that we are chosen and adopted, redeemed and forgiven, we're sealed and secured. And then in the first half of Ephesians 2, we learn that we are God's workmanship, we are his masterpiece, and we are brought near to him through Christ's death on the cross. And then in the second half of chapter 2, we learn that through Christ's death, this, this wall of separation between Jew and Gentile came crashing down where we are now unified. We are reconciled. Where every nation, tribe, and tongue that believe in Jesus is now one. And this new group of people are called the church, the body of Christ. You see, Paul, Paul's been, been sprinkling all of these little hints to us about the mystery of Christ's church. And this mystery, finally, in chapter 3, it starts unraveling. The secret begins to open up. And when, when we finally get to chapter 3, Paul is so caught up in the mystery that he stops mid-sentence and he finally says, By the way, if you didn't pick up on everything I was saying, here's the mystery. Look at verse 6. And this is God's plan. Both Gentiles and Jews who believe the good news share equally in the riches inherited by God's children. Both are part of the same body and both enjoy the promise of blessings because they belong to Christ Jesus. By God's grace and mighty power, I have been given the privilege of serving Him by spreading this good news. Though I am the least deserving of all God's people, He graciously gave me the privilege of telling the Gentiles about the endless treasures available to them in Christ. I was chosen to explain to everyone this mysterious plan. Here we go. That God, the creator of all things, had kept secret from the beginning. So the mystery is finally revealed, and we learn that this mystery, this plan, had been kept secret from the very beginning of creation. Now, let's be honest. How many of you were getting really excited about finally hearing and understanding this great mystery, and now that you heard it, you're sort of like, eh, 
It's okay. It's okay. Well, if that's where you are, I want to try and spend the next 15 minutes explaining to you how incredible this mystery actually is. Here we go. Before you and I were created, before the cosmos, the constellations, the clouds, the skies, the sea, the waves, the wind, the fish, the land, the mountains, the animals, before Adam and Eve, and most certainly before he created you and I, God developed a blueprint. He developed a plan for a worldwide family, a family where all people, all people that believe in him would be included. And this worldwide family would only come to fruition by the death and sacrifice of Jesus Christ, God's one and only Son. But you see, God held on to this plan. The plan remained hidden. It remained secret. And it remained a mystery throughout the ages. Now, maybe you're asking why. Why keep this a secret? Because God wanted us to discover the pieces of the puzzle. He wanted us to see that this world did not happen by chance. He wanted us to see that everything has been carefully planned and prepared in advance. He wanted us to realize that he's real, that he loves us, that he made us. He wanted us to realize that we are sinful and that we needed a savior. He wanted us to realize that every single person that has ever lived needs Jesus Christ. He wanted us to realize that Jesus came for everyone. And here's the incredible thing. When you understand this great mystery, that Jesus Christ is the plan, then everything in God's word, New Testament and Old Testament, makes sense. You see, that's why it's so important that churches today preach both the New Testament and the Old Testament. Everything in the Old Testament points to Jesus. Everything points to this great mystery. Everything points to this incredible plan that that before the world was created, God knew that he would send his son to save us. You see, when, when you begin to understand that Jesus Christ has come to give everlasting life to everyone, then this amazing book starts to click. Now track with me. I'm going to try and say it slowly. Here's the mystery. I'm going to try and put a nice little bow on it. The great mystery is that God always intended to bring the Gentiles, that's the non-Jewish people of the world, into fellowship with himself. Here's two key words. On equal terms with his ancient people, the Jews. We're going to keep going. And the good news, the gospel is that God has now accomplished this through Jesus Christ, the world's true Lord. And it's through this great mystery that all believers are now united as one. We are now one new group of people called the church, the body of Christ. And as the church, God has called us toward a very specific purpose. Are you tracking with me? Everyone good? All right. Now the next huge question has to be, after you read that, then what is the purpose of the church? What is the purpose of the plan? Look at verse 10 through 11. This is awesome. God's purpose in all of this was to use the church to display his wisdom in its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was his eternal plan, which he carried out through Christ Jesus, our Lord. (coughs) Mind blown. Now look. I tried to get the staff to install seat belts this week in your seats for the reading of these two verses. Too expensive, so you're just going to have to hold on to your chair, okay? We are going to dissect this because this is one of the most incredible passages in God's Word. By the way, if you don't know me well enough, every week I say this is the most incredible passage in God's Word. All right, now, what Paul is saying here really is going to blow your mind. Look again at verse 10. God's purpose in all of this was to use the church to display his wisdom 
in its rich variety. Let's stop there. Paul is saying that the purpose of this great mystery, the purpose of everything that we've talked about so far today, Paul is saying that the purpose of all of this is so that the church, that's you and me, could display God's wisdom in its rich variety. If you read out of the NIV version of the Bible, it actually says that the church's purpose is to display God's manifold wisdom. I love that word, manifold. It's not really a a word we really use much today, but I want you to make this awesome connection. The word manifold, that same word is used in the Old Testament to describe the multicolored coat that Joseph wore. It's the same word that we find here in Ephesians. You see, the idea is that God's wisdom has many different colors, many different layers. There's a whole spectrum to God's wisdom. Think of God's wisdom. Do this for me. Think of God's wisdom as a beautiful stained glass window. God has chosen the church. He's chosen you and me to be the light behind the stained glass window that reveals his beauty and his wisdom. The church is the light displaying the multicolored layers of God's wisdom. All right, hold on to your seat. Here's the rest of the sentence. So God's purpose in all this was to use the church to display his multicolored wisdom in its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. So what on earth does that mean? Let me explain it. It's awesome. I want you to imagine with me for a moment. Imagine that you are in a beautiful uh, theater. Now, I'm not talking about a movie theater. I'm talking more like a Carnegie Hall or a Sydney Opera House. Picture yourself in a beautiful theater. And I want you to picture yourself like you are a bird's eye view. You can see the entire inside of the theater. Now, I want you to look towards the stage in this theater, in your mind. I want you to look at that stage, and that stage is going to be the world. Now imagine there are hundreds of actors on the stage, okay? The actors on the stage, which is the world, the actors are the church. That's you and me. It's all of those that believe in Christ. All of those throughout the world that believe in Christ are standing on the stage. Now, over here to the side of the stage is God. And God is the writer. He's the director. And he's the producer of the drama that's taking place. Now, I want you to put yourself on the stage in this beautiful, uh, beautiful theater. And I want you to look out towards the audience. In the audience are thousands and thousands of angels that God has created in heaven. These angels are the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. You see, when God created the universe, track with me, this is cool. When God created the universe, all the planets, the stars, and the galaxies, he revealed his glory to us, the human race. It's through his creation that he revealed himself to us. But here we go. It's through the creation of the church, the body of Christ, that's you and me, that God reveals his wisdom to the angels. That's amazing. The conclusion must be drawn from this statement that the angels watch us. Here we go. The angels watch us because we're a part of the mystery. Now, if you think this is a little far-fetched, is this kind of blowing anyone's mind? I want to back this up with another amazing verse from God's word. Look at 1 Peter. If you want to flip over to 1 Peter chapter 1, 10 through 12. In this verse, Peter expresses this exact same truth about the angels watching and learning about the mysteries of God through the church. Here's what Peter says. Verse 12. They, by the way, when he uses the word they in this context, he's actually talking about the Old Testament prophets. They were told that their messages were not for themselves, but for you. And now this good news has been announced to you by those who preached in the power of the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Here we go. It is all so wonderful 
that even the angels are eagerly watching these things happen. In the original, I love this, in the original Greek translation, it literally says that the angels stoop to look. I love that word. They stoop to look. They bend over and intently observe the teachings and actions of God's people. You see, through both of these passages, we can conclude that we, the church, are a part of the mystery and the angels eagerly watch us to learn more about the multicolored wisdom of God. Isn't that cool? You see, angels, as we know them from Scripture, they're messengers of God and they also watch over God's people. You also, we, or excuse me, we also know that angels, we get this from Scripture, that they can also gather in massive numbers to sing praises to God. And we also learn in Matthew 10, 8, that they even find joy in seeing the Father's face. And in Job chapter 38, verse 7, we learn that the angels were present when each new star was hung in the universe as each new planet was formed. You see, the angels have seen the greatness and the wisdom of God's creation. They have navigated the the immense distances of space. They have watched God's people from the very beginning of time. They watched Aaron and Moses. They watched the blood-drenched offerings and clouds of smoke in the tabernacle in the temple. They saw the birth of Christ, his incarnation, his death, and they even had a front row seat for his glorious resurrection. Yet even the angels have much to learn about God's wisdom. So they watch us, the church. And as they watch us, God reveals his multicolored wisdom through us. So even the angels, even the angels can be an audience of the reconciling work of Christ through the church. It's amazing. You see, through followers of Jesus like you and me that are gathered together in churches all over the world today, This extraordinary plan of God is becoming known and talked about even among the angels. The secret that had been hidden for so many years of God's eternal plan is now in the open. You see, before God created the universe, before he created time and space, he planned to bring salvation and unity through Christ in the church. The Father decreed it, the Son implemented it, And the Holy Spirit empowered it. The church, the body of Christ, is the conduit that carries and proclaims the message of Christ. I'm going to say it again. The church, the body of Christ, is the conduit that carries and proclaims the message of Christ. So what does all this mean for us? Friends, we, the church have a huge responsibility in God's plan. You must understand that the church is a key part of the gospel. You see, Ephesians teaches that that the complete gospel includes both the teaching of Christ and the mystery of the church. Christ died and rose from the dead not only to save us, but to create a unified new group of people called the church. Friends, that means that GCC plays a huge part in the greater narrative of God's plan. We are all a part of this new unified group, and we are watched by the world and even by the angels. When we at Greenville Community Church preach the gospel, and when we live as the body of Christ, souls are inevitably drawn to Jesus Christ, the head and heartbeat of the church. GCC, we have a huge assignment from the Lord. We have a huge responsibility to share the love of Christ to this community. And see, we must evaluate what God has called us to do as a church. And we have to do those things boldly and confidently in the name of Jesus. You see, we must must be fueled by Christ's strength and we have to trust that he will empower us to make a difference in the lives of those In Greenville, we don't need to be afraid. We don't need to be afraid to invite someone to church or to talk about Jesus with a coworker or even pray with someone at the grocery store. We must cling to the indescribable love of God and allow Him to do a mighty work at GCC. 
We must be ready and prepared for him to lead us toward this new chapter of ministry. Friends, I believe with all of my heart, all of my heart, that God is about to do some amazing things in this town. I believe that revival is coming to Greenville. I believe that Jesus Christ is ready to deliver the oppressed, set the captives free, heal the broken and the battered, restore marriages and relationships. And I believe there is going to be an outpouring of men, women, and children that come to know Jesus Christ right here in this community. Amen. And look, it is my prayer that God would allow GCC to be a difference maker in this community. That he would allow us to be a part of his life transforming power. Church, we have a mighty work to do. God needs us to be difference makers in this community. So let me ask you, are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready for revival? I believe that the Lord is about to blow the roof off of this place. I believe that God has given us this property and this incredible building so that we can be difference makers in this community. I believe that he is able to do a mighty work through us and I believe that God is able to do infinitely more than we might ask or even be able to imagine. GCC, you need to know this. I am honored to be your pastor. It is a privilege. It is a privilege to seek the heart of God each and every day on your behalf. I absolutely love praying for you. And God has already broken my heart for this community. And I believe with all of my heart that God is on the brink of doing something amazing in this town through you, the church, the body of Christ. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are. God, it's very clear in Ephesians 3 that you have a very important purpose for the church. Father, GCC is is not simply here to just be a place where Christians... Come each weekend. While it is that, it's so much more. Father, you call us to be the church. You call us to be a part of the mystery. And we read in your word, God, that even the angels love watching because you continue to unravel your mystery through the church. Father, thank you for allowing us to be the light behind the stained glass window. Thank you, Father, for allowing the church to be that light that completely displays your wisdom in its its rich variety and multicolored layers. Father, I boldly pray right now that revival would take place in this community. Father, that men, women, and children who are far from Jesus Christ today would be completely close to you in the days ahead. God, we pray that your Holy Spirit would empower us to be agents that are difference makers right here in this community. God, we can't wait to see what you're going to do in the days ahead. Thank you for using us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.